So I mean, right on straight in with the kind of researchy stuff. What are we um, doing with instruments? And then when we kind of add all of this gear to instruments. So I um, uh, I will tell you about my practice as we go along because I won't like, double up on myself. But I kind of started making a list of kind of the, the stuff that we assemble. Um, uh, you know, like this is a kind of assemblage of materials that we've got here that includes a recognisable instrument and some other stuff. Um, in my case, because I'm a clarinet player, it includes things like reeds and mouthpieces, pieces, it includes all kinds of peripheral stuff, like mic stands, music stands if I'm using music, it includes, um, you know, the things that I need to get, get working. It might include sheet music in a school. Um, if we start working with electronics and in the digital domain and using that stuff as well, we're going to have maybe a computer or some kind of device, microphones, interface, we might be using some software, we'll have settings, we'll also have peripherals, we'll have loudspeakers, we'll have a sound desk, and, and you can fit a lot of things into that. But there's, there's one important thing missing there, and that's that human. So there's the person as well, right? So we're looking at like what's the overall instrumentalist, uh, and I want to start thinking about like how we um, how we perform always with um, we're never just completely isolated as a person or an instrument. It's always we've got to think about <coughs> all those different things. So we've got all those different things in there. We've also got um, people that we might be playing with. We've got a different space that we play in every time, singing every time. Uh, and we're doing that within an environment that sits within a culture. So we kind of, our, our, our viewpoint can kind of zoom outwards. Uh, and all of those things have an influence. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about this in about 10, 15 minutes. But this is what a lot of people are calling ecologies of performance. And you, you've, you probably have heard this term or the kind of ecosystem approach, performance ecosystem. Um, during the 70s, um, is it JJ Gibson? Is it? Is that right? I've got the right initials. Yeah. Um, a lot of people um, started to look at um, um, the situated nature of what we, what we do and how it fits into um, a kind of ecosystem. So um, that term of music performance ecosystems was used, first of all, by musician uh, um, and scholar called John Bowers um, and Simon Waters uh, used that, and it's been used by lots of people since. I think, I suppose, my, I try and uh, describe this as resisting a kind of linear approach to what playing music is about and performing music is about. So perhaps, perhaps we think of music as somebody has an idea or we have an idea and that that gets kind of notated or encoded in some way and it's translated by some sort of performer. Maybe that's you if you composed it, or maybe you're playing somebody else's work. And then we try and be faithful to that, and we try to communicate that. And so it feels like there's a kind of line going from the ideas realm through the human realm, the interpreter, the translator, through the instrument, and out to the audience, and you receive the work. And I think that's quite like, well uh, entrained in us, especially those people who come from a kind of classical music training. So that seems to be like the way we seem to think about music. And um, one of the things I'd like to open up today, especially as we kind of try and reimagine and reinvent instruments, is to change our focus a bit and say, let's think about situating <coughs> what we do and sharing it rather than giving it and receiving it. Let's think about the way that our bodies are involved, all of us. Like right now, you're contributing to this performance that I'm giving by, by being in my audience, right? By listening and responding and reacting. Um, and how that kind of approach, which I'll go into uh, later, also kind of helps to renew um, repertoire, renew the idea of what instruments are, and renew the idea of what a performance practice is. So, um, we're here to talk about music technology, aren't we, right? So this is the Google search, page one, image search, of the term music technology. And I have to thank um, Thor Magnusson, a friend from Brighton, who first showed this slide. And it's really great, because that's, that's great, isn't it? We look at that, and it's music technology. And we know that that's what music technology is, because that's what we think of when we think of music technology. Um, so then I, then I come to, like, because I'm a clarinetist, 
I like this is an example of a picture of a recording that I was doing. So, so what's music technology here? What music technology can we see in the picture? Anyone? Just list stuff. The, the clarinet itself is a technology. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, like the reed could be. Yeah, as well. good, fantastic. You've totally jumped the guns. Brilliant. You've totally jumped. That's great. We're going to save loads of time. So normally we start talking about cables, the mic stands. There's sort of some sort of thing here that you may or may not know that's got a controller. There's definitely some sort of weird pickup microphone thing here. But yeah, my, this is my point. As I, the, when I started, so I've. Um, I've been doing um, practice research in this area for since about 2013 when I started um, an AH, AHRC funded doctorate at the um, University of Edinburgh with a man called Joao. And, um, and I, I used to play all, all kinds of music with electronics, but I never, I never touched anything you know, that was music technology. But, um, and so at first I thought what my job was as an instrumentalist is is to try and marry these two worlds that clash into one another of like acoustic instruments and electroacoustic. And we hear that term, that acoustic and electroacoustic divide a lot, you know, and that's kind of the schism of the, of the two um, conflicting aesthetics or sciences. And, and pretty, pretty soon after I started, I got rid of that idea that these, two, these, these are separate to types of technology. So you're right, Samantha. The amount of technology between here and here, apart from that, is, is huge. There's, there's like centuries of research and knowledge residing in the current <coughs> mouthpiece, including you know, the total feel that I have for the instrument resides at the interface with my body, which is where this interchangeable piece of cane and this piece of ebonite and this kind of contraption of holding the reed on meet my lips, my teeth, my <coughs> mouth cavity, my throat cavity, my uh, chest cavity, my sinuses, my muscles. And, and, and there's like the feel of, and the sound, like the personal sound that I've developed over years kind of resides primarily in that area, right where the instrument interfaces with my body, which is kind of really interesting. Because when you think about instruments, we tend to think about this bit, right? And this is also important because it changes notes, but really like in terms of technique, most of my knowledge sits in this very finely judged area here, which I kind of feel. So yeah, so it's all technology. And that kind of leads us to the idea of like instruments evolve, basically. This is probably the earliest single reed instrument um, that we know about. So it's from 2000 years ago in Egypt. That's from about 300 years ago. Um, 250. By about 100 years ago, everything looked quite familiar. That's what a clarinet looks like. And along the way, we bend, te we bend technology around bodies and, and ergonomics. Uh, and we change technology and, and develop technology between performers, composers, makers, um, and, and, and develop instruments that uh, fulfill our continuing exploration of expressive means, you know, so we we're always searching for new expressive qualities. We also sit within a culture that might be, you know, a small salon music in one decade, and then much, you know, all of a sudden, within three decades, we're in large concert halls, and everything needs to project much more, and uh, we have more sophisticated technology, and different materials. Along the way, we get really interesting things that happen. That's my favorite clarinet picture. That's an 18th century bass clarinet, um, and you can see all kinds of solutions that have gone into the way people thought about how to get, <coughs> how to think about sound and, and musical expression and use technology to kind of really advance technology at the time to serve creative needs. And I think that's what we're doing. We're using technology to serve our creative needs. And um, along the way, we might go down some tangents that are quite complicated. So that's a solution. One solution to the fact that clarinet players in orchestras have to change from a B-flat clarinet to an A clarinet, it's exactly the same instrument, but slightly longer. Uh, and so this was an attempt to just have a little knob that you turned and it changes the direction of the airflow into the different clarinet. And it's an incredibly complex solution to a problem that it's not, it's not really that big a problem, you know, to change. It's fine, but it's not actually kind of that difficult. So it really took off. But it's interesting how technology can take us down complex solutions to 
these, and it's a, it's kind of a lesson. So um, we hear we often hear the term uh, that an instrument is like an extension of ourselves, right? We can think of it as an extension to ourselves, and you know that's quite it's quite an interesting uh, idea. Um, what happens then when we extend the extension into um, adding um, sound sources like these and um, sensors like um, you know, like microphones or, or um, motion trackers or, or whatever? Um, how does that kind of um, how does that change the instrument? I mean, that, that's something I want to think about. Um, um, because um, one of the things that we get through working with these instruments, yeah, I'm going to just switch my attention to here. So, what happens to yeah, what happens to? Um, I'll come back to that other stuff. What happens to musical instruments next, like in the digital age? Um, Let's just unpack how that might work. Like I've thought, I've got today. I've come up just with three approaches, and they're very broad. Right? So um, this would be a good point to show you a very short little snippet video because it's very cool. Do you know this? Do you know this instrument? Um, this, so we could make new instruments, right? With so we make new instruments with digital technology. That's one way we could use technology to expand our creative endeavors and use it. So there are thousands of examples of this. Um, this happens to be one because I was on a gig with this woman from um, Montreal, and it's um, a really nice example of something that feels like an instrument, and it has a nice, um, really short video. So Miriam Blau took the idea of um, uh, records, and spinning records, and um, so she made these kind of perspex discs, perspex discs that have um, um, that, that have um, transmitting technology in them, and uh, accelerometers, and sensors, movement sensors um, uh, that that send messages into the laptop through um, through software. And 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 the idea there's a very simple idea to the instrument, which is that um, when it's spinning uh, fully as a spinning top. Um, it does what it's supposed to do, and when it's slower than that, it um, glitches and becomes less predictable and, and behaves a different way. So she sets these things up and has sort of three or four on the go, and um, the oh, I don't do that. and uh, generally looks like cool. You could, if you look that up, you can find several videos uh, of her performing. She's, she's a great performer. It feels like it feels like an instrument, right? There's stuff to learn. There. There's technique to learn. There's 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 lots of musical possibilities, um, and so that's uh, like one example of a a DMR digital musical instrument. Right? Some of you know what it is. Um, we could also like have a parallel practice, so we could take an interface that we know, like a drum uh, or a uh, keyboard. Or a guitar or a violin, right? And we could, um, you know, about these. So we had these electric guitars around for quite a long time. That was one of the earliest ones I could find, 1931. Um, but we have similar interfaces that um, give us embodied. We can take the embodied knowledge that we've got. So you have embodied knowledge that you know will allow you to play that already, but it's um, situated in the environment. Uh, and likewise, <coughs> the knowledge. It's required to play that, but it gives you different possibilities, right? Um, and I have the knowledge to play something like that, but it gives me different possibilities. Um, but, you know, uh, what if you really want to play the violin? You don't want to play someone else's violin. You don't want to lose that. You don't want to lose what you've worked for. So I came into doing this kind of thing with 40 years of playing clarity. So everything. Everything about the way that I play has been highly personalised over a lot of years, and I, I really 
grudgingly give away pieces of that. You know, I don't want to change my materials unless I choose to change my materials. At least that was definitely like a priority when I started doing this kind of work. I really wanted to keep as much as possible away. So if we think about augmenting, uh, use this term augmented instruments, uh, take, keep what we've got that we value and see what we can add. So some really nice examples, one of the best is this, um, one of the kind of um, most well documented and, and kind of really good example is that the grand piano is a really fine instrument. Why would we take anything away from that? It's fabulous, right? It does, we love everything that it does. But there are things that it doesn't do. It can't um, crescendo from nothing to fortissimo. It can't bend and notes. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, now has all of those possibilities through a contraption that fits inside. And this is a really interesting device if you've never, if you want to make a note of it, magnetic resonator piano. It doesn't actually operate through speakers, still resonates within the body of the instrument itself. And you can go and see this thing in action. You can go to Queen Mary and they'll let you have a look at it. And you can see concerts out and about with it. Um, you've been to have a go on it, haven't you? Yeah. And it's fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we can use an augmented drum. Rod is going to show you an augmented drum, I guess. <coughs> you know, and we're going to have, uh, that's the deep sort of thing that today is we're going to try out instruments, voice. We can also augment the voice. But um, but let's not forget that the instrument is, ins it's, an ins it's a human technology assemblage, right? So when we augment an instrument, we're also kind of augmenting ourselves. We'll come back to that in a minute. How can we augment? Well, we can use fixed media, we could, which is often called tape or backing. Anyone who's done karaoke has worked with fixed media. Right? That's exactly what we do. We can multi-track. And you can do that in a very synchronized and locked down way, or you can get kind of more flexible with it. One example of that is this piece I worked on with Alex Harco, where we we took a multi-track piece by Steve Reich, which is 11 clarinets, um, and we took the aesthetic of a remix and decided how we, what we wanted to keep, which was kind of certain um, harmonic traits and certain rhythmic traits uh, and we wanted to keep the idea of a live instrument plus a fixed media and we made a new piece um, in 2013 um, which we added some new samples to and kind of um, completely reinvented the piece. So that's that's a way to work in with fixed media that, that was maybe like the Steve Wright is quite locked down and I feel you should feel quite restrained and quantized as a performer. In this one, I've got flexible triggering and the sections are a bit more fluid. You can choose when to bring them in and out sometimes. So it kind of feels, fixed media is not necessarily really fixed. We can also, it's got a really great advantage for the composer or the sound um, designer because you've got, in, when, you've used, when you've rendered the material, you've got control of it in terms of quality. So fixed media is really great for that. Um, real time, so um, lots of you here have worked with electronics before, but some of you may not. So, like, I'm going to do like 20 second digital audio 101. Um, if we have um, a microphone here, sound is vibrating, goes into a mic, it turns into a, it physically vibrates something that turns into a voltage. And um, once that voltage signal is, um, we, we've got that voltage signal, we need to get it to a computer, it needs to turn into a number. Computers only into that number, right? So we need a, uh, we need a, um, we have that um, vibrating plate that produces a voltage, which is kind of <coughs> analogous to the vibration of sound in the air, right? So we call it an analog signal. A lot of this, a lot of you know, <coughs> an analog signal, and that analog signal needs to be turned into a number because otherwise, the computer won't understand it, won't know what to do. All the computer wants to do is maths, right? So we need to give it ones and zeros. So we put it through an analog to digital converter, an ABC, right? Remember that term. Um, once it's gone through the analog digital converter, it becomes a number, and our computer's happy because it can do maths. Right? So you can do maths, and the maths might be send the same number to the output. Right? Um, no maths at all, and now what we've got is a recording device. So we send, take the number. What do we need? We have an analog to digital converter. What do we need on the other end to send it out? You can guess. You probably know something. Digital. We need to do digital to analog converter right DAC. Um, and you'll hear that term a lot. So and you have all of that on one of the if you have a laptop or a phone, you have an analog digital converter, a microphone, you have a digital term, you have a DAC, which 
use the headphone or on the Bluetooth app of your, <laughs> of your, of your, of your not phone. So we get sound in and get out. What the computer can do is can do maths and it can do it really quick. So the really quick maths that it does can change, process, alter, record, remember, um, uh, and you just generally mess with those numbers before it sends them out. Um, multiply them, add them together, um, you know, duplicate them, all those kind of things. So we can do all that kind of stuff. Now, um, so that will, it'll, it'll convert that, that number back to an analog signal and it'll send it down the wire. Voltage goes to the loudspeaker, pushes the speaker in and out, and it's back in the air as vibrating sound. <coughs> if, if we can do that um, in no time at all, it would sound instantaneous. But nothing takes no time at all. But if we could do that within, say, like <coughs> less than 15 milliseconds, then that sound coming in and the sound coming out will sound more or less instantaneous to our ears. So that now we've got the possibility to do what's called a real time process. That's what we mean by uh, this term, real time. It's not really real time, nothing happens in real time, right? There's always loads of things. Um, but that's the idea. So by about the 1990s, um, particularly like mid late 1990s and now in the 2000s and uh, the 20 years since then, <laughs> God, already. Um, these things have become ubiquitous and they've become very fast and we can do that. Uh, and so we can play with effects, we can distort the sound, we can harmonize, we can um, reverberate, you know, and, and we can also, you know, delay and we can, and we can map things and, and so that's what a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, there's an interesting thing, we're not going to get around to doing much of this today, but there's really interesting stuff happening in this area, which is um, kind of creativity and systems that kind of, um, so we can get software algorithms that kind of um, <coughs> imitate the ways of um, improvising backwards, for example, or making music backwards. So co-creativity is another way that we can augment. So fixed media, real time, and co-creativity. The co-creativity is an interesting one because, you know, a responsive system, a real-time system that we play with, and this is what we're going to be doing today, it's where's the interaction going to come from? It's going to come from that sound coming back and you, and you, and you, <laughs> interacting with it on a musical level as a musician, right? So that's where the, like, that's where the humans come in, right? So we can make a responsive system very feel very, in my experience, we can make a responsive system, and yours, I think, as well, from... What, uh, what I've heard you say, you know, a responsive system feel very interactive by the way that we negotiate with it. Yeah. So what what is, like, we're coming to the end of it now, we're almost wrapping up. Um, so my practice, I kind of think of, like, I try to think about, like, different creative roles that I have and how I use this stuff. Um, going back to that Steve Reich piece, there's a score and I have to play the notes and they have to be pretty much in time in a certain tempo and they need to be in the right place at the right time and the right notes and executing instructions. And again, we tend to think like those of us who've grown up in the classical music world, we tend to think about playing other people's music as executing instructions, right? Um, the score tells us what to do and how the piece should be. So, we, so I'm kind of putting a bucket there that says quite a lot of the work that I could do is about executing instructions, but I also interpret those instructions. We don't want to go down that, have that discussion today because it's a very long one. But um, but basically, um, there are instructions there, and they need to be they they need to be um, kind of uh, interpreted. I also like work as an interpreter to write, <coughs> right and this is like um, more in recent years. It's become composers have become really keen on performer input, so there'll be sections or there'll be whole pieces that are kind of frameworked and then material is improvised within them. And it's become very much more kind of popular. So I found myself working in that area as well. And interestingly, I spent a lot of time in that area because it's nice to have a little bit of structure and a lot of input. Um, and the other, I guess the other area that I find I work in is like as an improviser or an instant composer, or maybe that my, my process of improvisation leads to pieces being formed or more or less formed. You know? So I guess I'm thinking about those things as kind of agency or authorship from a performance perspective. Right? So you think of these things from a performance back. Um, running through really, really quickly, what 
what kind of things in my research did I find that I, as an example of someone who has played on acoustic instruments for all my life, right? Um, what kind of things did I care about and what did I find that I was researching? You know, because practice research is really interesting. We can come in with ideas about why we're doing something but maybe not fully formed questions. Um, and so I found that um, in a practice research area, sometimes you have to let the questions emerge a little bit. You have to go in with some kind of impulse, sometimes called an epistemic impulse or, or a kind of just a motivation, if you just use this fancy word for having a motivation to do something or try something or fix something. Um, and uh, I found that I cared about three main areas. It's really, really brutal to break music up into separate things, but sometimes it's useful to unpack or put things in buckets and see, like, let, let's say we can break up the idea of <coughs> music into three areas. We know we can't. <coughs> Just say we can, what do we learn from doing that? And what might sit in the middle that might be where my research is? So I found that I really, um, I really uh, cared about sound and I had lots of kind of pragmatic things that I needed to think about, like balance and blend you know, presence of the, all the different elements. I found that I have like a particular idea of sound concepts, and maybe you do too, like what you want your instrument to sound like, if you have preferences, tone concepts maybe. Um, I also found it changes with um, the space. So some pragmatic and some personal concerns, and they related quite strongly to identity, um, which is interesting, but we don't come talk about them too. I found that I wanted to be more in control, <laughs> a control freak. Um, controlling instruments is really sort of feels important. Um, but this is an interesting thing that happened here. So, like, we've got, I want to be in control of myself. And there's this kind of paradigm in instrumental technique of mastery, you know? It's like a power dynamic between me and the instrument. I want to be able to control this thing. I want to be able, you know, when we, classical music especially, it's like, Oh, such and such has beautiful control of the upper registers, you know, like the heart registers. Amazing control of intonation, you know, or amazing control of their, their voicing, you know, inner voicings of the chords in the, uh, the piano. We, feel, we hear that kind of stuff all the time. Um, we want to have control over the things that we assemble together. We also have to deal with material agency a little bit, though. So what I mean by that is, like, the piano lets us do certain things that it influences us. You know, different. Every time you use a European piano, right? every time you play on a different piano, it exerts its own influence on you. Every time you play in a different space, it exerts its own influence. On you. Um, we have to be able to trust, right? And we have to, um, yeah. So we think about control. And I, I, so material agency got me thinking a bit because actually this stuff makes me do certain things, and it made me think back to that slide about performance ecologies and how I'm influenced by a lot of things, and not just by the instrument itself. And then I had a really big question. Yeah, that's the, just a reminder about the performance problem. And then a really big question about this. <coughs> it was really like, especially in experimental music, which is what we're generally talking about here, and in improvisation, it was like, why am I so hung up on power and mastery, you know? And that's just my background, because I grew up through classical music. And you know, there's so it's placing so much emphasis on control that actually um, found that um, letting um, material agencies become a thing that I was more tolerant of and letting systems exert more influence, some sort of letting go of control made some of the work I was doing more interesting. So, um, so I started questioning the idea of power and mastery, and I changed the <coughs> I changed the category. It's, this sphere of concern. So I really, really think it's not that surprising that an instrumentalist would really care about sound. We really need to care about interagency. Let's 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 think about balance of control. Okay. Interestingly, all of these things feed back to me just playing the clarinet when I go and do this. Just play a regular concert. And then in performance, the thing that is kind of really difficult to talk about that is seems to be sit right at the heart of what we do, is that um, the thing needs to feel live and, and alive, right? And that's one of the reasons why I, I invited you today, because I find that your stuff is, is incredibly kind of um, 
um, you know, that, that is incredibly live um, and engaging. And we, have, we engaged in, in, a, in a negotiation of attention and we have to deal with flux and contingency, unpredictable things. That's our material <coughs> agency again. We have to, um, we have a sense of expectation. And that might mean that we, we Im we're involved in some sort of narrative, however abstract we think of that. You know, we, music happens through time and we think about form. And we might be thinking of some sort of narrative. Doesn't mean that, I'm not saying that everything we do is a story at all. Um, that would be nice. Um, but, you know, that there's some form, narrative maybe is the best way of thinking about that. And then that, there's some kind of, kept coming back to this word presence um, for those things. So present, um, present technology, um, present, you know, um, present in the instrument, you know, by uh, cognitively, by, by having embodied relationships to it, present um, in the moment of the performance, present um, in terms of each element, of, you know, interagency, each element having its own presence, like op optimal presence. So I started to think that's actually what I was researching. Sound, balance and identity, like <coughs> some sort of shared narrative interagency. So that's kind of how I thought about my my work. So that and that, I'm, I'm pretty much going to wrap it up there and hand over to Rob. But, um, so what I try to do is like the work that we do today is just a really tiny taster of throwing loads of technology into the the, the evolving of instruments. And that, that that evolution of instruments, the only difference between today's age and previous centuries is the pace of change. You know, for me, that's the, the only difference is really that, that the violin uh, as an instrument, the piano as an instrument, the drum kit as an instrument, has kind of moved and, and evolved through through performers, makers, composers, and um, improvisers, whatever. Um, using these things over decades or over centuries. And now, the stuff that you were doing five years ago might not work anymore. <laughs> And the stuff that I, you know, the stuff that I, I made a year ago might be superseded by something else. So we can look at something today. Um, so we just was going to finish today by by this slide that, that just said that doing this work. An interesting thing about research is that it can change our perspectives, and it can ask, and it, we can come out of a period of research asking certain questions, and come we come out of it not with answers really, but with with further questions or further ways to reframe the work we do. So in my, re in my research, over the past four or five years, I've really come to think of, rather than think about putting an embodied technique of an acoustic instrument together with an electroacoustic practice, I just really think about reframing the idea of instruments as, as, as a very you know, embodied human phenomenon. It's basically a negotiation of materials. And those materials are filters and resonators of physical energy, sound, sweat and toil, um, identity, you know, personal, <coughs> personal, personal, personal things that we have, and, and culture, you know? <coughs> the we play, the world we live in, the, the time we live in, the technology we have, the technology we will have, the technology we might have, the technology we definitely did have, and those influences. And that sort of really helps, and I find that that kind of really motivates me as a, as a player. And so this research, the idea, and, and the last thing I'd say about that, because because there's, there's a lot of PhD but PhD uh, researchers here, you know, sometimes we feel like the research can be a bit of a bind. You know, we're supposed to be making things, or, you know, making art, and the research, you know, sometimes we feel like the research could just get in the way of that, or even, you know. People can say, oh, it's, it's not good to, to do research because it, it um, um, you know, it, it kind of destroys the work or doesn't leave you free to work. But I think if you, if um, what I found through 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 this was that thinking about my own practice like this put me in a situation where I got very motivated uh, and got into work, um, and that that fed my motivation to get back into it. And so the whole thing sort of became a bit of a cycle. Um, some things that I've done, I'll leave these slides up for you, but some things that I've done we won't go into now because I'm going to keep moving on. But um, there, um, 
There's a system I might have a go at with, you've had a go at this with me, but that's an option to have a go through this system I played with Martin um, Parker. This is me and the improvising into a responsive system. with Martin's thing was that over, <coughs> over I mean you could, you've had a brief experience of using that but over a period of months of using that system it began to feel like an instrument and so we described it as having a sort of new human instrument identity was established as an aggregate that behaves like an, an assemblage of intimately tied agents so it really felt like like an instrument the other thing I used a lot um, that I found to be really motivating was one of yours your systems, which um, is based on um, what I started to think of as fragments. So I started this series called Fragmentations. Well, um, so Rod's stuff is all available, and I will hand over to it very soon so you can just show you. But it's all open source and available on his website. So by the end of today, you will, I think, all be um, adding to his uh, tracking stats on that website. Um, I um, <coughs> two pieces. I'm just going to play one of them for time's sake. But I may, um, to be really quick, um, CC Combine takes a uh, take a sound sample that you've made, and it can be any sound sample. So I use this sound sample. If csokolcsoknak a tüzelángból elépünk, ideg az este, néha szaladunk, sírva szaladunk. So this is a woman reading a poem in Hungarian, um, and then uh, Rod software kind of um, splits that up into twit millisecond chunks, uh, and then I can set parameters, and then I can leave it. And it's basically just one process. It's like I didn't use the randomized dot you had in it, but it was basically one process. And my my interest was how long can you keep one process going? and find settings that feel really interesting. And I, you can see me in my kitchen here in Edinburgh, uh, just kind of uh, having found some settings that I'm enjoying playing with, just using the mic on my laptop and some headphones. No fancy kit. Um, and just finding something that, that, that kind of felt engaging, that I could push into this thing and then it would spit back little bits of sound at me. So um, I, I won't play all of this, but you know, yes. So by teasing out it, I can get it to say that, and I set the I set the parameters so that I could hear some syllables. And I think towards the end of the video, you can kind of see me trying to negotiate an ending. And finding it until that by chance she says that we've eshed out the evening and it just felt oh it felt right to stop there. Yeah. And, and and so I set up something that was sort of um, felt live and it felt like it had a sound, it felt like it had something I could tease at. Um, you can also I could also use clarinet sounds. I also used some of your drum sounds. <laughs> This is just me generally improvising into not particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I basically um, took the take the mouthpiece of the clarinet and <coughs> play, uh, with that sound set being uh, co improvised back at me.
So, coming this idea that I present performers embrace an exploitative context. <laughs> Use technology at the time to expand expressive means. Right? Take time to form embodied relationships with all of our materials, and that includes this stuff. So, spending months, spending. I've worked with your system now for three years. Uh, I still play with this setup. I still play with my partner's setup that I've worked on for four years now. Develop a unique voice. Balance up foreground and background elements, and stay present and live. And that's so. That's for me. I, in terms of what I found, my research outcomes were that this is what this has got under the skin of what it means to me to be in it, like uh, a performer. And this is what I want from interactive systems. This is what I want from augmented instruments. Right. Basically, in other words, I think. Um, this is a great way forward for twenty-first, mid twenty-first century instrumentalists. So, so, be up to date, commit to your instruments, how to say, leave room for others, and keep things like, live and connected. Right?